And joining us now, David Cotts, who's a Professor Emeritus of Economics and a Senior Research Fellow in the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of The Rise and Fall of Neoliberal Capitalism and the co-author with Fred Weir of Russia's Path from Gorbachev to Putin, The Demise of the Soviet System and the New Russia. And he has an article at the Democratic Left, The Ukraine War Dilemma for the U.S. Left. Welcome to Background Briefing, David Cotts. Well, glad to be back. Well, thanks for joining us. And in terms of the dilemma for the U.S. left, there was a vote in the House on supporting Ukraine, and AOC and members of the squad voted against it. Only of Cory Bush, like three or four, voted against it. But they were joined by an equal number on the furthest fringes of the far right in the Republican Party in the House, and that's really saying something. So what do you make of that uh, anomaly? Well, uh, I think the reasons are different. There, there's a long history of the U.S. of there being a uh, a section of the the right wing, the political right wing, that is leery of getting involved in foreign wars. That goes way back to early uh, 20th century, uh, and then uh, there has been on the left also an opposition to getting involved in foreign wars. The right wing sees it as it's not worth wasting American lives to help other countries. That's the right wing approach to this, whereas the left wing approach has been that wars uh, hurt working people of all the countries that participate, and uh, the our country should not be joining them. Uh, so it's a different basis uh, for reluctance. And in this case, uh, some on the Republican right seem to admire uh, the Putin regime in Russia. Uh, they, uh, those who are uh, kind of right-wing nationalists see Putin as a role model. Whereas on the left, uh, I don't think AOC uh, or the others on the left see Putin as a role model, but are concerned about the, the uh, war, the enthusiasm for war that's being ginned up around this very complex conflict. Well, also Christian nationalists uh, identify with Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church as well. Yes, in their indeed. Anti-gay and anti-Muslim biases, etc. But do surely... Well, by the way, let me, let me just point out there's an irony. The Russian government does not take an anti-Muslim position. There are, uh, there are a lot of Muslims in Russia. And while it's true that Putin has endowed the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church with special status, he's been careful to also cultivate the Muslim uh, institutions and communities in Russia. But do you think that the American left recognizes that, you know, if there's some nostalgia for, for socialism, that is misplaced? If anything, Putin is certainly, he hates Lenin, he admires Stalin, and if anything, he's a fascist. Well, I, I basically agree with you. There's a, in some, in a small section of the Western left that uh, sort of never got over a reflexive identification with the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union uh, was dismantled. The Communist Party rule was uh, ended. And uh, Putin was part of the movement that overthrew it. Uh, and he, uh, as we saw in Putin's uh, long uh, uh, article, I guess you'd call it, or post, his speech, uh, in which he, uh, he blamed Lenin for the problems, uh, problem of Ukraine, as he sees it. Uh, Putin is the head of an oligarchic regime, uh, oligarchic capitalist uh, state in post-Soviet Russia, he has uh, completed the process begun under Yeltsin, the first president, of eliminating uh, any democracy in Russia after the Soviet Union had been significantly democratized in its last years before it was dismantled. And uh, some people are misled by the fact that uh, there are inter-imperial rivalries in the world and Russia, which is the Russian state, which has emerged as a uh, a weaker but still powerful uh, capitalist state has conflicts with the with U.S. imperialism, and so the Russian state takes what the left finds to be good positions on some 
uh, questions, such as opposing the U.S. war in Iraq. But that doesn't mean that the Putin government is uh, progressive uh, within the world stage. And again, I'm speaking with David Koch, who's a professor emeritus of economics and a senior research fellow in the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of The Rise and Fall of Neoliberal Capitalism and the co-author with Fred Weir of Russia's Path from Gorbachev to Putin, The Demise of the Soviet System and the New Russia. And he has an article at the Democratic Left, The Ukraine War, Dilemma for the U.S. Left. And in terms of this war, which... There's an expectation on May the 9th, which is a big holiday in Russia and, and former Soviet Union, the day that celebrates the victory over the Nazis in World War II in Europe. There's an expectation that Putin will call for a full mobilization. And already they're starting to annex parts of the occupied territories in, in Ukraine and switch to rubles and put their own people in the government. So it looks as if Putin is doubling down and this war could go on for a long time. Since you study the Russian economy, when is it going to get worse? The theory being or the strategy on the part of the West is that eventually the sanctions will start to bite and Putin will have to make a choice between his imperial ambitions and the reality of his economy and the assumption is he will choose the latter. What do you think? Well, I don't think there's much grounds for believing that. Sanctions have been applied in many cases historically, and uh, uh, they, they only are effective in very unusual circumstances. And it, it, I can't see any likelihood that the Russian government is going to change course over sanctions. Uh, remember, about half the, more than half the countries in the world have remained neutral about this war. And... Uh, there seems to be unanimity if you just look at uh, North America and, uh, or at least the northern part of North America and Western Europe uh, in supporting uh, sanctions against Russia. But uh, China, India, there are many, many parts of the global south. Uh, it seems highly unlikely they're going to observe sanctions. If the, if the U.S. tries to enforce actions against third countries, it's going to be a big problem. So it, it looks to me as that there is going to be economic pain in Russia, but uh, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which that leads to a uh, giving in to what the U.S. is demanding. Uh, there is a uh, underlying, a long-standing underlying conflict that is not Russia versus Ukraine, it's Russia versus the U.S., that stems from the attempts since 1992 to put uh, NATO and uh, U.S. military, uh, U.S. weapons, U.S. trainers around as much as possible of the border of post-Soviet Russia. There's, it's part of the policy of the announced policy of preventing uh, any state from becoming a potential serious uh, economic or, or military uh, competitor to the U.S. This is this is not a reasonable strategy. Uh, it's been applied to China, leading to a lot of problems. And uh, and in the case of Russia, uh, the flare point was the uh, Donbas region of Ukraine, which is a complicated issue. And I think Russia was making reasonable demands around that, which is that Ukraine go back to a position of neutrality. Uh, and respect the accords that were reached in uh, 2014, the, the Minsk Accords, Minsk II, which called for uh, the uh, parts of the Donbass region to have some autonomy within the Ukrainian state. I think those are reasonable demands. Well, there's no question the historical record is pretty clear that the encroachment of NATO eastward never took into consideration R Russia's legitimate security concerns. Right. But is there, and, and in fact, the Pope just said that NATO has been barking at Russia's door. So is there any evidence that had the U.S. and NATO in, in the post-Cold War era, instead of expanding eastward, and they, you know, there's the famous Baker-Gorbachev conversation, right. which was designed to get the Russians out of Germany, where Baker said, we're not going to move an inch eastward. 
right. which was was automatically shot down by his boss, President Bush, the first President Bush. But nevertheless, had the U.S. and NATO encouraged a neutral buffer zone in that in the Baltics and in Poland and the Czech Republic, etc., would Russia have become less territorial? Because Putin keeps saying that the greatest tragedy, geopolitical tragedy that happened was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So what's the evidence that Putin and the Russians would have accepted a neutral buffer zone and become a peaceful, non-aggressive country? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's easy to uh, ascribe the uh, worst motives to an adversary, and it's hard to prove that, uh, you know, what they might or might not do in the future. But if you look at uh, uh, what has happened uh, and then evaluate Putin's statements, I mean, most Russians think the demise of the Soviet Union was a disaster. Uh, this is an overwhelmingly supported view in Russia and in uh, uh, some of the other former Soviet republics. Uh, the living standard of the majority of people went down when that happened. And, and uh, there, a very, very, the sort of worst form of capitalism emerged. Uh, so the fact that Putin voices that doesn't mean that he's got a strategy to recreate the Soviet Union, which was uh, whose basis was a socialist economy. Putin is a, uh, supports capitalism. And if you look at uh, how uh, Russia under Yeltsin and Putin has related to the other countries in Europe, uh, Russia has, has uh, emphasized uh, building economic ties with EU countries. It has not tried to, uh, there's never been any hint of a threat to the its former allies in Eastern Europe, and even the former republics. The Russia has had a sort of a dance with Belarus over the years, where Russia has encouraged Belarus to form a close union, but has never forced it. It, it appears to me that what the Russia, that what the Russian government wants is uh, a buffer zone and good relations with the states around it. Uh, recently, uh, Kazakhstan, the Kazakhstan government asked for for uh, Russian troops to help quell an outbreak of protests. Uh, Russia sent troops. The American media said, oh, they're never going to leave. And they left very soon, you know, within days. There's, I don't see evidence that Russia aims to uh, expand its uh, control and and eventually possibly even threaten Western Europe. I think that's a myth that has been propagated to justify a very aggressive response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which, by the way, I do not think was justified. I do not support Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, which has terrible costs for people in Ukraine and and in Russia. So just in closing then, the Maidan revolution had more to do with Ukraine wanting to join the EU than joining NATO. So is Putin more concerned about the EU? Because my sense is that when you look at it, what does Putin offer as this kind of capitalist mafia state run by oligarchs and the Siloviki that he regulates? I mean, what do they offer? They offer the governments like like Lukashenko. They offer gangster government. And if you have a, a pro-European democracy with the rule of law next door, whose standard of living will be improving uh, because of the lack of corruption, because corruption is debilitating. So wouldn't that be a threat to Putin? If all these countries on his border were neutral but thriving democracies with the rule of law... What does he offer? What is Putin's model? Well, I agree that the, Russia does not offer an attractive model, but I'm afraid that the model that has actually been brought by the EU to Eastern Europe is, is somewhat different from the promise. I, I can see that uh, you know people in uh, Ukraine look at what life is like in in uh, France or Italy, and it's a lot better than what they have. But uh, I think it's a real stretch to call Ukraine a budding democracy. I think it has a rather uh, similar structure to that of Russia in many ways. 
Uh, it has a bunch of oligarchs who are very powerful. Uh, uh, just recently, the uh, uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, banned the main opposition party. The Ukrainian government has taken over all the mass media. It doesn't look like a democracy to me. And it was installed by the armed overthrow of a democratically elected president in 2013 to 14 uh, in, a, in an uprising where the, uh, the armed units that seized the presidential uh, offices uh, were neo-Nazi uh, organizations. And it was then that Ukraine changed its position from neutrality to a plan to join both the EU and NATO. Both of those were adopted. Uh, and the American, our government supported that overthrow uh, because I think they saw a chance to eventually get Ukraine into NATO. So it, I think it may be that the uh, Ukrainian people who were westward looking were mainly interested in the, in the EU, but the events that have developed have, been, uh, have involved a plan to pull Ukraine into NATO. And of course, now that Russia has invaded Ukraine, that I think the evidence shows that there's increased support among Ukrainians for joining NATO. So the, the invasion was a disaster for, I think, uh, for Russia, as well as for Ukraine. Well, David Coates, I thank you very much for joining us here today. Okay, nice to talk with you. And again, I've been speaking with David Kotz, who's a professor emeritus of economics and a senior research fellow in the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of The Rise and Fall of Neoliberal Capitalism and the co-author with Fred Weir of Russia's Path from Gorbachev to Putin, The Demise of the Soviet System and the New Russia. And he has an article at the Democratic Left, The Ukraine War, Dilemma for the U.S. Left. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters, and I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon. And to help us sustain this program into the future and assure it remains free to all, please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org donate or publictruthmedia.org, where you will find our nonprofit Public Truth Media Foundation, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And if you missed any of today's program and would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we'll include extended interviews searchable by topic and have made it easy for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we also encourage your ratings and reviews on these platforms. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media. And please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family, and colleagues. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another background briefing at backgroundbriefing.org. Bye for now. The guy that lived next door in 305 Took the kids to the park and disappeared by half past nine One more light goes out in